I'm a villain. I'm, I don't purport to be anything other. And I have a mission. And that's basically to get back at everyone who has wronged me. Mm -hmm. And I don't care who steps in my way and how innocent uh, a bystander they are. Um, they're going to get run over because my mission for revenge is more important than anything else. And you see a character like that who tells you he's sharing his truth with the audience. And yet, if it's portrayed properly, he becomes so seductive that as audience member, you should be rooting for him. The story is, there's a difference between flawed, imperfect people and evil people. But is that a difference of degree or kind? And how do you tell stories that portray evil convincingly and in a way that doesn't turn off audiences? Today, we discuss the challenges of portraying evil. I'm Mary Schertz. This is Lightwise. This is part two of a two-part series. In a companion episode, we discuss the challenges of portraying holiness. So be sure to check that out also, wherever you're consuming this podcast. Elijah Alexander is an American film and TV actor who has been in the business for nearly 30 years. He stars in the role of Atticus, a secret agent for Caesar, in The Chosen, Angel Studios' hit TV show about the life of Jesus Christ. Here's a clip of Elijah from The Chosen. Do you know who the Zealots are? The extremists, they reject them. They're martyrs with a persecution complex. Arrest him, we'll only be adding fuel. Torture him, he gets a seat closer to his god. No, I want to kill him, Petronius, in the act. And then I want to watch his rat pals scurry their way back to their nest with a story they can't glorify, can't teach to the next class of marks. And do you know why? Why? Because we were just better than they were. That's why. Rome won. <laughs> you should be a general. Now what fun would that be? Well, that was Elijah Alexander as Atticus in The Chosen. You can watch it by downloading the Angel app or visiting angel.com slash chosen. And Elijah, we, we have him here now. Welcome to Lightwise. Thanks for having me, Mary. I appreciate it. it. It's an absolute delight to have you here. Uh, as, as you know, the, the, what we're discussing today on the podcast is the challenge of playing evil as an actor, um, uh, or actually pretending to be evil. But before we go into that, I wanted to talk more about how evil is important to storytelling, how it needs to be incorporated into a lot of our stories. What do you think are some of the challenges um, of evil? incorporating evil as a storyteller, whether in film or I know you do a lot on the stage or literature. I'll start by saying that when I take on a character, uh, the number one lesson that I learned way back in the day was that in order to inhabit a character and portray it with any truth, uh, you, you cannot judge a character's um, motivations, his or her actions, you can only try to uh, develop an understanding of where everything is coming from. And so when I take on a role, uh, I, I do a, a, a few very basic things when I'm creating a character. First of all, I, I get a, an idea of the entire story and where this character fits into the telling of that story and what kind of um, uh, force that character needs to enact in order to tell the, you know, the, the, the story that we're telling, you know, uh, from a bigger perspective, uh, from a wider scope. In developing the character, um, like I said, starting from a place of non-judgment and developing an, an understanding of where the, that character's history, how he, what kind of family he was born into, um, what kind of upbringing, you know, he had, did he have a uh, strong parental influence? What was his um, uh, childhood like? And then uh, the second question, not any less important, but what is this character's relationship to God and to um, his own sense of spirituality? Now, in taking on this role as Atticus, it's so funny because I never 
the, the, the idea of evil never came up. Um, you know, in, in, in going into this, and I could talk like uh, for days on this, but evil exists as good does, light and dark both. In, it's part of the human condition. It's part of um, our experience as spiritual beings in, the, in human form. And like everything else, we've been given a choice, right? To employ one or the other. Um, each of us have to go through try our own trials and tribulations, our own challenges in life. Uh, and if, if we neglect the dark, if we either do two things, either neglect the darkness or give over to it, become enslaved to it, we're gonna, we're gonna um, prolong our suffering here in this life. So I think when we talk about evil, you know, the, the, a, a human form of evil incarnate, it usually is because someone has become enslaved to the darkness, not dealt with it, not confronted it, not befriended it, but become enslaved to it. That is a really fascinating way to approach building out a character. I really love what you're saying about, for specifically the role Atticus, but also it sounds like for any character that you're building, this idea of like, so am I evil doesn't occur. And I actually feel like that very much is parallel to the human experience. You know, we love larger than life villains in storytelling, but how many real people in the world are sitting there going, yes, I'm evil. You know, that's not part of their, the, how they build themselves up. That's not how they uh, uh, understand themselves. Look, that's why we go, that's why we read books. That's why we watch TV, go to see, go to the movie theater, go to live, see live theater. We, we, we have mirror, mirror neurons that are firing and connecting as we're watching other people go, going through an experience that we can understand. And in order for us to develop any kind of empathy, we have to, we have to be presented with a human, truthful, authentic portrayal of whatever it is, whatever you want to call it. And as audience members, we can heap our own judgments on it. We can say, oh my, oh my goodness, I've had that thought before, but I've never acted on it. Now I'm watching someone act on that thought and I'm watching them either fall or thrive, right? Based on it. Yeah. It's interesting that this topic is evil because, because we, I mean, we often say, well, in particular, in, in regards to this story, Christ is, uh, you know, is a bringer of light, which he very much is. And then all the forces opposing him are evil. And I would contend that, um, and I, I, love, I love using the word opponent uh, instead of devil, or mm -hmm. right? And because we each have one within us, right? This opponent that is continually challenging us and uh, forcing us to make a choice either one way or the other in any given circumstance, to choose the light, to, to choose that, or to succumb to the darkness. And I also love the word enemy as it applies to this, the telling of these, this, this amazing story. Um, and it's, it's also interesting that that's a turning point for Atticus, the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, when Jesus says, uh, you, you've heard to love thy neighbor as thyself, but I say to you, love thy enemy, which it was, is a completely new concept. concept. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and a very new to Atticus, who spent a lifetime in, in war in, um, as a peacekeeper, but, or so he thinks, right? But this is a new concept, and it's changing the way that this character is thinking. Well, and I love that all that you're saying there is so much about examining choices, of not acting like you make a singular choice that then puts you in the firm camp of light or dark, that some people might be consumed by the dark, but I, I don't know of many actual circumstances where a singular choice gets them there, that instead it is that opposition internally that, and you're continually being confronted with choices, that it can be summed up that multiple decisions can now be decided are good or evil. But again, as a person, how often are you asking yourself, Am, is this an evil choice? You know, I, you know, how many times are people actually confronting themselves on those kind of black and white terms? 
Which actually leads me to my next kind of question. Um, so to I love that you're bringing up Atticus so much because I do think he's a messy character. And by messy, I mean he is not easily defined as a singular thing. Conversely, some time ago, I saw you performing on the stage as Richard III, who literally in his opening uh, monologue that opens the play says, I am determined to be a villain. Yes. And I'm wondering... Uh, a, a couple of things there. Um, first off, I'm wondering if in your development of the character of Richard III, if you were able to add some texture to that. Um, it, you know, it, does he portray himself as like, yep, I'm evil, that's it, but internally, does he have a different interpretation? And if if not, do we have these kinds of archetypes in literature, in film, that are easy to distinguish of this is evil and this is good because people want to have a simple story sometimes. They want to play out the, what if I made those choices and kind of see where that leads without having to make those decisions themselves. Do they like to watch that unfold? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yes, and I mean, you can go all the way back to the beginning, the origins of theater with the Greeks, you know, where they were working out on stage a dialectic, an argument, a debate to, to sort of come to a, some understanding of the problem. And sometimes there had to be provocation, right? So then you move into, you know, we can go through the whole history of theater, but you get into commedia and you have two dimensional, like superficial, superficial, but very complete uh, depictions of either of one type of personality. And often there was the villain, right? Who was pure evil or pure this or pure that. You had, um, you know, a, a character representing the fool who was always um, chastising, ridiculing, uh, but also the wisest one. I was about to say, the one who can cut through all of the stories we tell ourselves of who we are and instead say, actually, who you are is this. This is the, the truth of what you're doing. And I think we come to the truth through storytelling, uh, through telling each other stories, through identifying with certain ones, attributing meaning to, to stories, to give ourselves um, a purpose to, to sort of reinforce our purpose in life. Um, I think it is, uh, you bring up Richard III, here's a character that does from the get-go tell the audience, I'm a villain, I'm, I don't purport to be anything other, and I have a mission, and that's basically to get back at everyone who has wronged me. Mm -hmm. And I don't care who steps in my way and how innocent a, a bystander they are, um, they're going to get run over. Because my mission for revenge is more important than anything else. And you see a character like that who tells you he's sharing his truth with the audience. And yet, if it's portrayed properly, he becomes so seductive that as audience member, you should be rooting for him, <laughs> even when he does the most heinous things. And that's where this idea of having a visceral experience, you know, is can be really informative because you're watching someone devolve and you know that's not the right choice to make, but you're watching him follow through with that choice and fall as a, as a, as a consequence. He, and yet me as an actor playing Richard III, an utter villain, I have to create a human depiction of that, of that character. I can't come on, twirl my mustache and, uh, you know, broad stroke it. I have to fill in why he's doing it. And so I did just as, as I do for every character. I went through the backstory. And I mean, there's lots of actual research, you know, yeah. on Richard III in history. He was a, an actual character who was a younger brother. He was neglected as a child. Now, all of that, we all have our own story. It doesn't excuse mo morally reprehensible behavior. Um, but we can learn from that, you know, as, as audience members. Ultimately, ultimately, the audience is disgusted with Richard III yeah. and, can, and can identify behavior that is inappropriate, that is criminal, that is shameful. But not until we watch it play out, right? We have to see it play out on stage 
not in real life. And then we can learn something from it and we can attribute meaning to it. I still had to make that, make him a fully fleshed human being. Otherwise it's not gonna be, not gonna be believable. Also he is, I will say this, th that's a character that has lost his sense of empathy. He's a sociopath, clearly, lost his connection with other human beings and is morally reprehensible. The thing about that is that Sh Shakespeare created a character that knows that and owns it. And you watch him fall because he, he fall, he must. You yes. Know? He, yes, I, I do agree. Shakespeare doesn't neglect the consequences of those choices. I think Shakespeare also wanted to give us a full cathartic experience of someone so knowingly making the wrong choices. Yes. He doesn't shy away from the consequences, but he, like you mentioned, he wants you to understand and at times be seduced by that course of action. Because I'd like to think most of us have moments where we could get back at the people we feel have wronged us and then choose not to. But that doesn't mean that opposition inside doesn't want to see what that would look like if we made that different choice. Right. So what a gift. We get to see someone live those choices out on stage or on the screen, and we can learn from that, and it can inform the decisions we make for ourselves. We all have vengeful thoughts. We all have jealousies and insecurities and small thoughts, petty thoughts um, that don't employ our higher good, our best, you know, that don't always cause us to use best practice as a principle. But through the art of storytelling, we're given the gift of uh, information, just more information, right? And having an experience as if we went through it ourselves. I mean, that's the whole point. That's, that's why the human performative uh, art form is so important, so vital to our culture, to our society to developing empathy. In some ways, performance, um, especially of those types of characters, pushes the viewer to say, okay, but what would I do in that circumstance? You know, maybe someone who has has floated for a bit, hasn't had massive challenges come their way for a while, and you could almost say their morality muscles would uh, atrophy without engaging with story, without having those thought exercises over and over again of like, what are my lines? What do I consider good? What do I consider evil? What do I consider forgivable? And what do I consider the, the absolute condemnation of a character? Wow, that's beautifully said. You <laughs> beautifully said, yeah. It's, uh, and that's exactly, that's exactly it. And you know, now I'm in a, in a, in, in a similar way, uh, I've been grappling with What's, what Atticus is confronted with on a daily, moment-to-moment -moment basis, which is new and part of, a, part of an awakening. And, and I like that your character is also so couched with being confronted with, with Jesus, who in this story, and also uh, Jesus is perceived as a, a pure force for good. And like, how do you encounter that? Like, how do you respond to that? Which he was, and, and it, it, it's amazing to see as, a, as Elijah, to, to be on set and to have, be in, intimately involved with the, the, that messaging being disseminated, um, being out in the world and how it immediately affects this character, like you said, who's been in, on one tack for his entire career. Um, but also as Elijah, the actor, it's been a very moving, awakening experience for me. Uh, and when it's happening simultaneously with a character you're portraying, there's nothing better as an actor to have, enjoy that kind of alignment. And, and to kind of to that alignment, uh, you had mentioned at the top of this interview, and it's been in my head ever since, about as you build any character, you're considering their spirituality. Not necessarily saying their spirituality in a Christian or a Jewish or a Muslim or a Hindu perspective, but rather in a, do I believe there's a higher power? Do I believe there are uh, forces beyond my ability that assert themselves in the world? And with that belief, either, yes, I do believe that, or no, I reject all of that, or I'm really not certain, all of that creates a pretty rich area to grapple with ideas like do with this character consider their choices evil. Yeah. It, it, 
it, I mean, you said the word and it's belief. It, it really jumps out at me and faith. And so investigating a character's, what he, he believes, his belief system. And so then you've got to get into the psychology and go back and, and say, what were this character's limiting beliefs? The things that were holding him back Ooh, from, being, like from, from being free. From being ha- being a full expression of a human being on this walking this earth during this time in our lives, and then faith. What does that person have faith in? And I think um, Atticus has lost faith in the God of his childhood, in man. He's seen a lot of bloodshed. He's seen a lot of needless, unnecessary bloodshed. And he's, that's part of why he's retired. That's my explanation for myself. And it really resonates. So he, he comes back down to the scene. And what is truly inspiring and utterly sort of moves him forward, that cu- his curiosity, his natural curiosity, is because he's witnessing people with such conviction, such deep, deeply rooted faith, and it's Jesus' faith in something beyond, in God, in his Father, in the Father of us all, right? As a son of man, as a son of God, whatever he is and whatever he's purporting to be, it really piques Atticus's curiosity. Not only that, but Jesus' belief in man. And so... And then his, the disciples' belief, belief in him. And through him, their belief, their, um, whether it's a reinvestment in their own personal faith and belief or a resurgence of it or an emergence of it, uh, uh, the, the beginnings of it, you know, um, I think we're all born in that place. And, you know, many of us have to spend a lifetime sometimes remembering who we were as that pure spiritual being of light when we were born. But Atticus is witnessing firsthand a deeply rooted um, system of belief and faith, not only in God, in something other than us, bigger than us, but also in, the, in our fellow man. And I think that blows Atticus' mind because I think he has lost faith in man. One of the many amazing things that Jesus had to teach was he, 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 he sought out the controversy, right? He was, he was grateful for the rejection. He was grateful for the opposition. He welcomed it. It enabled him, that attrition enabled him to shine and to have influence and to be the light. You know, it's like, I always, you always think about, you know, Jerusalem. My, so I have a, a great deal of family in Israel. My, my father was born in Egypt and raised in Israel. So I have a deep connection with Israel and with um, the community and with, uh, and, and also spiritually. It's, I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem, but it is remarkable that three of the major world religions come together, converge in one place, and you can feel, I mean, it's on, you can feel the energy of uh, ecstatic spirituality and often religiosity, and it's, there's conflict, but there's, in the center of it, there is um, a light that comes, you know, and yet, you look at it, and it's surrounded by it. darkness, surrounded by challenge, surrounded by um, opposition, and there's a lot of heat coming out of that place. I feel like that's what Jesus was in, and he was willingly in it, you know, and Atticus represents a force that's of opposition, right? Because Atticus in particular isn't trying to, to um, destroy Jesus. He's tr- trying to protect the people from a revolution, right? So, you know, looked at differently, you can look at Atticus and say, well, he's uh, the right hand of Caesar and he's all about maintaining control and he's, he's out for Jesus and the disciples. And I would just tell you that's not true. From my perspective, I'm trying to avoid, to protect and serve. We're setting up, yes, the realm of Rome, the Roman Empire is first priority. But I want it within that realm, I want to keep the streets safe. 
That's why Atticus goes after the zealotry, because they're aggressively um, and violently, their tactics are aggressive and violent, and they're trying to bring about um, the end of the disciples, and they all have their own um, uh, um, motivation and objectives, right? Atticus speaks on behalf of Rome, but, I, but his objective is peace, not war. He's trying to avoid it. However, he is an opposing force because, I mean, he does, te- he does tell him, look, preach all you want, but do it outside of the city because you're stirring up unrest. And unrest is going to lead to civil war and civil war is going to lead to revolution. And that's going to be bad for everybody. And I think in the course of that, he's listening to the messaging and he's witnessing miracles and he's, uh, his faith in man is becoming, is being restored. You know, I set my intention before every show, give me the strength equal and greater than my opportunity and let me help to alleviate suffering by identifying it, by moving into it, by embracing it, and uh, alleviate suffering in others because they're gonna watch what the consequences are of these particular set of actions. And you touched on this earlier too, which was great. It's all about choice. So when we're talking about evil and good, we're talking about not one choice, but a series of choices that define us as human beings. But ultimately, it's not our thoughts, right? Thoughts come and go, they don't define us if we don't identify with them. Not our words, although we have to be careful with what we say, because words influence. Words have great influence. And we have a finite number of words that we're gonna say in this lifetime. So we might as well be careful with them in the way we choose them, right? And they have power, words have power. Abracadabra, Abracadabra is Aramaic for I create as I speak. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, and this is, this is stuff. I teach classes in communication and the power of the spoken word. And so I, I, I always bring that up. I understand the power of it more so now than I ever did. So I try to be conscious and careful with my words. But ultimately, it's what we do that defines us as human beings. It's the choices we make over the course of time. And not one choice, but a series of choices that define us. It's the sum of those choices. And so, you know, we can, we can look at someone who continually chooses to destroy, to, uh, to embrace and employ the, dark, the darkness, to lash out, give way to anger, instead of embracing it, channeling it effectively, because it can be, anger can be an effective emotion if it's placed properly. But again, it's all about choice. And then, and that gives us great freedom, right? I mean, because we can, we can actually also choose what to think. Yeah. Yeah. That actually, that idea of choice brings me to what I'm going to say is the last question of this fascinating discussion, which is choice, of course, is what we go through as humans. It is what characters go through on the stage or on the screen, but also the choices of storytelling of what is a good and a good an accurate depiction of evil that will engage the audience tell the story without accidentally dipping into participating in the evil an example i would use is the film sound of freedom that's currently in theaters is about child trafficking it's a horrendous dark you can't find a speck of light in that choice and i thought the filmmakers did a good job of acknowledging the weight and the evil of that practice, but without choosing to accidentally make you a participant by showing too Mm. much, by dwelling too much in those moments. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what that line is for portraying evil, or and by that we really mean people that are continually making choices that lead to evil ends, without encouraging the viewer to like that or to accidentally through viewership feel like they have been a part of that act i mean that's that's about our artistry and craftsmanship in the way we tell the story you know but but yeah i saw the movie it was um i think amazingly done uh and um really moving but i think it's because and uh, by the way well done i know it's yeah. just do- Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was 
it, it was profound. And uh, um, I think, you know, it starts with uh, the director because he had been living with that, those stories for years, right? And so he I did a little dive into the history of how the, you know, the, how long it's been, this project's been out there and how long that the director had been working on it. Um, and you can tell it starts from, um, it's a passion project that started from an impulse to bring attention to, to something that it needed to be addressed. And many people didn't understand the truth of it. So in portraying the truth, he had to go into the darkness of it, but I think it was intentional and you could clearly see what he was trying to do with it. And so I think it starts with the director and then assembling a group of actors and, and, and the, way, the way it's shot and with the intention. I think it's all about intention. I really like that framing that like you can go into the depths of things that no one's going to defend as a good choice. No one's going to say, well, based on, I mean, they had a tough background, you know, you know, they, they, no one's going to defend that. But, and that's, and that's actually good and a strong choice as long as the intent was always to do something with it rather than just to say, isn't this evil? Yeah. You know, but to say like, to draw you in to say, what would you do next if confronted with that? as opposed to like, I don't know if it's wallowing or just soaking up that bad feeling, instead using it as one of those oppositional forces that we've been talking about. I mean, this the story of Tim Ballard, you know, and, and, and the good he did. Yeah. And focusing on that. Um, and, you know, being able to save 55 lives and numerous lives since then. And, but, but also bringing attention to something that not everyone knows about. I didn't know, I didn't know, and I've known about these, the, the horrible uh, um, infrastructure in the world that's happening, you know, with child sex trafficking, I mean, and child pornography and all of these. What I didn't know is how deeply rooted it is in this country mm -hmm. and that it's not comfortable no it, it's, it, not, it's, it's not, not comfortable. comfortable and i and i i have been working for years with organizations like world vision that you know who, who um you know their 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 um, goal is to feed impoverished starving kids in the world and they have a really big domestic program i've become more involved with them I, i've uh, when the pandemic started, I mean, I could go on and on, but I was, what was interesting is that it caused a lot of us to sort of redefine our roles in society, in life, our roles as human beings. For me, it was, I'd given 30 years of my life to being an artist and I have, that has great value for me. And I honor artists because I honor the art of storytelling as, as, an effective way of changing lives, of, of bettering ourselves as human beings, and also of alleviating our suffering. And I think The Sound of Freedom brings attention to a, a, a real problem and forces people to have a reaction, uh, to have a response to it, and hopefully to be a part of changing something that is in drastic need of being changed, and ho hopefully to help contribute to alleviating the suffering of, that's happening so, right next door to us, to all of us. But that movie and the more information I have um, has changed something uh, in me enough to motivate me to be a part of the solution as, a part, as opposed to apathetically going through my life, not paying attention to these issues to, to the suffering, to the and, kids. And yeah, and suffering. maybe passively, yeah, maybe passively no, wishing no. things were different, but not yeah. actually taking action, which and again, is, like that's yeah. a perfect summation about the power of story. That's this a perfect best, of, about it teaches you empathy. Right. It drives you to action. This is the best part of what film, TV, theater, this is the best of, of what it has to offer is that through the telling of these, these stories, we attribute meaning to them. and and hopefully they, they affect change. They're, they are provocative enough. They bring us, 
they give, give us clarity, they uh, refocus us, they give us an experience of something and motivate us to change, to become better human beings and to become more actively involved in uh, positively influencing our communities, the communities we live in, the world at large. I mean, we have to start where we live. Yeah. Uh, we have to start with our families and with our communities and the states we live in and the states we work in and then, you know, move out from there. But that's the best of what art, art can do. All paths, art alone endures. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, through that movie coming out and its success and its exposure that we can eliminate this problem and, and alleviate the suffering of these poor children and kids. Uh, uh, sorry, I could go on for days about it. Thank you so much for sharing. I actually, like, I found that really powerful for us to talk, you know, on a fairly esoteric level for the majority of this of like, oh, yes, this is what's compelling about story. And this is what's complex and interesting and messy. And this is why we find meaning in our performances. But to then kind of end with you sharing your personal experience of, of, of being having a story told to you and how much that can can have an impact. I love that that just showcases that even the storytellers uh, are, are just as susceptible and open and excited by a story that drives them to action. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I mean, stories, stories made me the person I am today. This was a joy. Thank you again, Elijah. You're very welcome. This was terrific. Lightwise is a video podcast production of Angel Studios, released every other Tuesday. To watch more episodes or be notified of new episodes of Lightwise, click subscribe or download the Angel app now, wherever you get your apps. If you prefer to listen instead of watch, you can find the Lightwise audio podcast version wherever you get your podcast. Also, be sure to watch The Chosen, the first series about the life of Christ on the Angel app. And check out Sound of Freedom, still playing in select theaters. For more information, go to angel.com. This episode of Lightwise was hosted by Mary Schertz. It was written and directed by Joel Ackerman, produced by Cameron Jackson and John Shea Van Sickle, and edited by Cameron Jackson, with sound recording by Garrett Briggs and sound mixing by Brian Densley. Thank you.